Agency's Drinking Beer is brought to you by Proposify, software that helps you deliver beautiful proposals in the cloud and close more deals. All right, well, welcome to our Christmas special. We have Jennifer Faulkner with us. Woo! Christmas Angel. Christmas <laughs> Angel. We have Kevin Springer. Christmas Devil. Yeah. There's no Cri- Christmas, Christmas Devil. Christmas Daddies. <laughs> Christmas Daddies. You're Christmas Daddy. I am yeah. Christmas Daddy. You're the dad of the office, aren't you? Sometimes. On Tuesdays, at least. Why Tuesdays? I don't know. It just sounds good. <laughs> just that's the day. And Kyle Racky, lump of coal. No, I don't know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't know. Fuck. I just was going for something. All right. What a good Sorry. Movie. Okay. Well, this is our. This is the last episode of Agencies Drinking Beer for the first season. So we've had a whole year of this bullshit. Yay! Yay! Congratulations. I don't know why the good, the bad, and the ugly theme song came in. Because it was good, bad, and ugly. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But Jen made us delete the ugly ones. That's good. I'm the ugly filter. No, when she it comes let me keep the F bomb in the last beer. one, though. I did. She let me keep that F bomb. So if any listeners out there think they've heard the ugly, you have not. <clears throat> no, there's been worse. That will be released 50 years after our death. That's the B roll. It's the DVD extra. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Director's cut. We'll give it away uh, from our, on uh, our 10,000th customer. We'll get a, a copy of our. Our editing room. Floor. Aren't we supposed to reward them and not punish them? <laughs> With just me being drunk. Um, we're excited about the the parties this week. Should Lots be fun. of Christmas parties. Yep. Mm. Yeah. I apparently we are doing a Thursday proposify party, yep. aren't we? Yep. And we're making a signature drink on Friday. I think the uh, the hot drink is the one that everybody wants. So yeah. we're gonna go with the mulled apple cider and spiced rum. In a crock pot, right? <laughs> of course. We're going to keep it warm. Broth and booze. You know, broth has made a big comeback. Has it? Yes, it's quite the foodie thing now. What's broth. the difference between broth and just like buying beef or chicken? Bullion. Bullion. Well, one, bullion is just like, it's basically like Mr. Noodle seasoning. Yeah. Like real broth would be cooked down from the bones and oh, yeah. you, you know, all that kind of stuff. The sto- and shit. the yeah. stock and all that the kind real. of stuff. Yeah. It's like the real deal. And it's very good for you because it got all the nutrients out of the bone oh. and it's all a big thing to sip this warm broth. Bone now, juice. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Bone <laughs> juice. I'm not really into bone juice, but Apparently you are. Apparently it's it very it sounds good for like you. I'm a <laughs> <laughs> bone juice expert. <laughs> That's one of your many areas of expertise. <laughs> All right, let's get back to Christmas. Um, what are we talking about? Um, we have a good, we have a really good offer right now that Jen put together. You called up a lot of SaaS companies. Well, we featured our latest blog post. You wrote a great post featuring uh, a lot of the SaaS products that we use to keep Proposify between the ditches. And uh, and then what we, a way to think of it. We <laughs> they do a good job. We we haven't ditched yet. Mm-hmm. So um, and then we contacted them, and some of them came on board. So we have this great smart business stack, and everybody should check it out because there are I think about a dozen companies offering awesome discounts, so you can try out their products. So and they range from like. Web development tools, accounting software, keyword finders, uh, customer service, Groove, WagePoint, Olark, all kinds of great companies. So people should check it out. Check it out. It's on our it's on our blog. Yeah, or if you're just listening to this, you can go to proposify.biz slash smart dash business dash stack. Is that right? I think that's I'll right. I'll put it in the show notes, too. Okay. That would be good. But those lots of good companies, out. and you should check it out. <clears throat> Absolutely. Don't delay. And uh, the offers deals. mostly expire by the end of December, so right. get it now. Exactly. Buy now. Buy today. The gin- As they say in marketing. It comes with a Ginsu, too, doesn't it? It does come with a Ginsu <laughs> and a ShamWow. Oh, yes. nice. Sham well nice. as well. And you should also uh, get on these because it's really guilt free Christmas shopping, right? These are for your business. It's this true. It's good. You can claim these. Tax write off. You're not being selfish. This isn't like you buying yourself a yeah. 
Commodore 64. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, that's just, you were like, in your head, you're like, video game. What's the last video game I've ever heard of? Commodore 64. Me too. Jen. An easy bake oven. <laughs> oh, I love those. Every reference goes back to the 70s or 80s. Do you know that the Easy Bake Oven, it was actually a light bulb that... That's what cooked it. Yeah, it was the light, bulb. It the light yeah. bulb. Nobody can hear you, Kevin. You're like 30 Sorry. miles away from the mic. It was a light bulb. It was a light bulb, yes. Uh, and I was watching this show last night about Christmas in the 60s, and that's when the uh, Easy Bake Oven debuted. But what they mentioned was, apparently now it's really evolved because boys like to be chefs now, too, according to television. They don't like to bake, though. Well, Baking is still kind of a girly thing, isn't it? According to the uh, television program I was watching, and you know how they are, are the authority, Television's they've kind of manned up the Easy Bake Oven to make it more attractive to boys who really? want to bake fudgy brownies <laughs> and strawberry <laughs> sprinkle cakes. <laughs> 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 I got two Easy Bake Ovens one year because Did my you? parents were divorced when I was a kid. And they would never talk to each other about what they were get, getting us for Christmas. Wow. And like more than one year, I got exactly the same gift from them. I got two Easy Bake Ovens. And my poor dad, because it, it was Christmas always after with him, so he was always the one returning his gifts. Oh, this is a sad. sad tale. This is a sad it's tale. It's a sad tale. Yeah. But you could bake multiple dishes at the same time if you had two, right? Yeah, and, and in two locations, so I could have been like a baking franchise, right? Could have been. One at my mom's, uh, one at my dad's. None of it was edible, been. right? Oh, yeah, you no, can was eat it edible. Oh, you can eat oh, that yeah. stuff. I thought it was like Play-Doh. You no, know, no, 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 no. These no, big oven made real, real, real stuff. Real. Wow. You just added it was, water. It's like I said, it was made by a, uh, I mean, it was cooked with a light bulb. Yeah. It was Sounds weird. gross, yeah. Yeah. No, they were, it was good. Yeah. It was kids, right? It was mm. all sugar and salt. It was awesome. <laughs> a little sugar and salt. That's all we need. Well, I need to see a man about a dog very soon, so uh, we should probably move on to the interview with <clears throat> Brent Weaver. <laughs> I'm here talking with uh, Brent Weaver. He's the CEO at You Gurus, uh, based out of the Greater Denver area. And you gurus helps uh, web design agencies uh, run a better business. Thank you for being on the show, Brent. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. So let's uh, let's get into it. I, I, when I'm reading up on your bio, um, I know you wrote a post for six revisions. Uh, I'm not sure what the date was. It was maybe uh, a year or so ago. And you talked about how you had a really brutal awakening in 2007. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, pulling out the dirt, <laughs> coming in, coming in strong, just like, that's what, that's talk, what the about listeners how, <laughs> talk about how your world was turned upside down. Um, but there's a yeah, payoff yeah. at the end. Sure, sure. So I, I ran a, a successful web agency here in Denver from 2000 to, uh, 2012 and in 2007, um, basically realized that I had no idea how to run a business. And I don't think I had even really thought to myself that I was running a business up until then. I think my, my, my humble beginnings were very similar to a lot of, uh, freelancers out there in that, you know, you have a skill set, you have an interest and you decide that it's a, a good way to make some money. And then before you know it, it turns into kind of your job. And then before you know it, you've got people working for you and, um, and, and you kind of say to yourself, well, you know, is this a business? I guess it maybe is. And, uh, and I really had never been formally trained in how to run a business. I, I had never worked for anybody else. Um, I did not go to school for business. Uh, so there was a lot of gaps in terms of my knowledge. And, um, even though we were having some success, uh, we were making some mistakes that, uh, eventually pretty much almost shut us down in 2007. So, you know, we, we had terrible cash flow situations. We were chasing every lead and deal that came our way. Uh, we had no clear and coherent marketing strategy. Uh, we didn't really know who our ideal customer was. We, we thought, I, I specifically I remember telling somebody this in a, in a networking event one time. I said, oh, yeah, we, we don't have a niche. We, we really thrive on being able to work for anyone. And, uh, and the guy kind of chuckled. And I, I thought I was being really smart telling him that I you know, basically didn't have a marketing strategy, didn't have any idea who my ideal customer was. I can do uh, anything. I just, exactly, right? So, so there was all sorts of problems. 
and that really um, came to light in a in a pretty big wake up call when I didn't have any money in my personal bank account. I had quite a lot of debt, um, debt with the IRS, um, as well as uh, you know debt with my employees by not paying them. And I think the only bill that we had somewhat paid was uh, our internet bill. And I even remember at the time we had been shuffling between internet services because we needed to keep the internet on, but we couldn't, uh, we couldn't actually afford to, <laughs> to make the payments uh, at the office. So we basically were, you know, canceling one service and not paying the bill and, and, and hiring another service and, and, and doing what we needed to do to keep the lights on, but maybe uh, some things that I probably wouldn't do the same way these days. I'm going to hopefully make you feel a little bit better and tell you that Kevin and I were, were in a very similar boat about maybe three, four years ago or something like that. Um, I think at one point I've told people this before, I couldn't afford to get across the bridge. There's a bridge between Halifax and Dartmouth and uh, you have to pay a dollar and I didn't have anything on my card so I couldn't get across <laughs> it one day. So it was pretty embarrassing. Yeah, when, when uh, Kyle uh, shared that post with me, I said, oh my God, this sounds so familiar. That's uh, That's one of the reasons we wanted to share that with the listeners because that's you know it's it's a hard business you know and i've i've been self-employed most of my career in, in other industries but i'd have to say that the agency business was the hardest one big time so for us we um you you did a lot of smart things and kind of figured out how to run a business and of course that now that's what you teach other people to do you know for us we kind of got out of the agency game i think if we had a state in it we would have had to do something would have had to uh you know, hire you or, or use you gurus to kind of figure out what the hell mm-hmm. we were doing. But, um, you know, I think a lot of, I don't think we're alone. I think a lot of agencies struggle with that, as you probably can tell. So tell us what changed when you were at that low point and how did you turn it around? Um, yeah, and I've given several talks on this, but, uh, you know, I started reaching out to some mentors and, uh, or people that I didn't really understand they were mentors at the time. There were people that had offered their help. And I started to kind of talk to them about some of the pains and problems that we were uh, undergoing and c- began to get my informal education in entrepreneurship. So uh, a lot of people that are, are business owners, it's, it's, you know, it's not like we're going to put our business on pause and go get an MBA. And I would even question whether an MBA would even be worthwhile to the average entrepreneur. Um, and so I started getting that informal education of some of the things that um, – you know, I try not to use terms like right and wrong. Like a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs will get up and, and, and give presentations on, oh, well, we were doing all this stuff wrong. And um, and I, I try not to feel super guilty about those things that we were doing as if they were right and wrong decisions, but more they were decisions that were driving specific outcomes. So I can give you an example. So uh, at the time, I didn't really track and monitor my time. And as a service business, your your most valuable commodity is your time. You're essentially, you know, the way we at least had set up our business was was mostly around uh, billable hours, right? So we're doing X amount of hours, we're getting paid this much, and it was kind of crazy that we didn't track any of that. So when you think about, you know, let's say you're a a jewelry store, um, and your most valuable asset, of course, is probably your diamonds. You know, would a jewelry store um, ever operate without running inventory on their on their diamonds? You know. Probably not. If they if they did, they would start to, you know, probably lose track of diamonds. They'd walk out the back. Employees would steal them. Um, they they wouldn't have a good grip on their most valuable assets. So one of the first changes one of my mentors told to me, he said, "Look, as a service business, you're trading time for money, and your employees are trading time for money, and everything in your business revolves around, you know, where you guys are spending that time. That's your most valuable resource." And at the time, I really viewed my, my my time as an unlimited resource. I was willing to put in 60, 70, 80 hour, 100 hour weeks. And I would just basically be this elastic band to what the demands were on the business. And um, and, and that was really unfounded. Even though I'd, I was willing to do the work, the time was definitely finite. And when I started to track my time, I started to realize that my most productive hours, the, the hours in the middle of the day, I was primarily um, giving those hours away for free to clients, doing free unbuilt support, um, putting out fires for clients here and there, um, doing you know follow up three, four, five, six months after a project launched, and essentially I was um, you know using my most valuable time for something that the business was actually not recouping any any money on, and several of my other team members were doing the same, and, and so that simple uh, change for us of so moving from untracked time to track time. Not necessarily billing for everything, but just becoming aware of that. Um, that was a huge shift for me. I, I realized I was doing about 20 hours a week of unbilled time. Uh, and that was time I should have been spending selling, you know, schmoozing with clients, 
defining my ideal customer, figuring out how I was going to reach, you know, the bigger and better clients. Instead, I was, you know, helping people with their email or, you know, hosting settings or things like that. Let me ask you, did you start, when you started tracking your time, and I assume you had employees by this point, so you, you were tracking their time as well? Correct. Yeah. Did you... Did you track all of your time or did you just track the client time? Like, did you also say, okay, I'm actually doing this much for sales or business development or was that kind of just a wash? Um, yeah. So if it was, if it was a, an actual client, um, I tried to track that time as much as possible. I mean, we probably went overboard a little bit in terms of, you know, even tracking, you know, unbuilt time, like education and, um, research and things like that, that were, were more on our own internal time. Um, but in general, if it was a five minute piece of work for a customer, um, we would track that at a 15 minute increment. So just, just taking into consideration the time it takes for you to, you know, receive an email, read it, understand it, communicate with the client, even if the work only takes you three minutes, you know, it's probably about 15 minutes of overhead to that action. Uh, and so, you know, starting to bill at those, or at least track that time in those 15 minute increments, um, was super valuable. And then from a sales perspective, you know, usually I would just put that into one time bucket, um, sales and business development, unless, um, I actually knew that that was turning into an opportunity. So if I was working on specific, uh, you know, discovery meetings or research for an opportunity that we actually had um, and were chasing, then I could get a little bit more specific and say, hey, I'm tracking time against this this project or whatever. Um, and, and really what you're looking for, at least for there, for, for me was, you know, um, I mean, obviously, in your billable time, you're looking for specifics because you've got to build a client at the end of the month. So you got to track like what you're actually doing for them. Um, but but for me, I was also looking for some broad strokes, right? Where am I spending my time? Uh, if I'm spending 20 hours on unbuilt support uh, and then, you know, 10 hours on miscellaneous business stuff, I might only be spending three or four hours a week on business development. And really, I should have been spending 20 to 30 hours a week on business development at my role in the agency. And when I got to see that, it kind of gave me that that big picture of, you know, my time's upside down. So I need to start taking steps to get my time back. Um, I started to delegate uh, and, you know, identify roles in the business. So we had somebody else take over client support. We channeled all communications from a support perspective to one email box, one, uh, one phone number, and we assigned somebody to take over that responsibility. So that freed up my time and I was able to invest that time back into sales and biz dev activities. That's a smart thing to do. That's definitely a, uh you know, with that kind of business, doing the small support stuff probably isn't the best use of a CEO's time. It it also can be really difficult to be profitable when you're just kind of billing out in these small increments. I mean, obviously, most agencies have bigger projects going on that pay more. Um, and, you know, the small little support requests, the 15, 30 minute increments you're billing for kind of fill in the gaps in between. But uh, did you ever get to a point where you were kind of like, either get a client on a monthly support retainer or, you know, kind of figure out how that works. Because that kind of killed us sometimes was people would, you'd launch a project and then, you know, if you're, say you offered free support for the first 30 days or that was included in the initial scope, you know, that like one day after that is due, they're like, oh, there's a bug or there's something that's not right or you have to fix it and you kind of feel bad billing them. How do, how do you kind of deal with that? Well, first of all, I would definitely change your mindset. I would, I would never feel bad for delivering value to a client. Um, I would, you know, always make sure that that's, that's a service that you're providing. It's a premium. It's an on-demand service. If you're, you know, if you've got a one day business turnaround on, you know, most updates or changes to their website or fixes or things like that, and you can provide, um, that in an on-demand nature, that's a, that's a very valuable thing. Um, you know, there's plenty of web designers that have no idea how to be profitable and support. And I would also say that if you can't be profitable on a 15 minute, um, support interval, then you probably aren't profitable on a 10 hour support interval. So you have to think about how you build that system to where it's something that you actually want to put energy um, into. So if, you know, if you're willing to offer support at a 15 minute interval, um, and it's profitable for you, then then that that's a part of your business. If you, if you can't make that profitable and you're not willing to invest in that, then that means that something is wrong in your revenue model that you shouldn't even offer that, right? Or or maybe your your minimum interval is one hour, right? It's just the terms at which you're willing to do the work in a way that is valuable to your business as well as valuable to your client's business. Make sure everybody understands those expectations, understands the processes that they're going to engage in those services, and never be apologetic about invoicing or billing for that value. That's a good point. Probably 
probably it's the Canadian in me. I, I want to <laughs> apologize for it. So, so um, it, and, and it's, it's a dangerous thing though, right? Cause that's where I was at. I was like, Oh, this only took me five minutes. But then when you do five minutes at scale and five minutes turns into 20 hours a week and you literally are in the red in your business, then that thing that you think you're doing as a favor to your client ends up actually being a danger to your client because you may be, be you're, you're probably a linchpin in their online success. So if you go out of business, if we would have gone out of business, we would have had, you know, a hundred plus clients um, would have had to undergo um some serious transition. I mean, we had the keys to everybody's kingdoms and we've had lots of, you know, proprietary code and plugins and servers and configurations. And if we would have actually gone out of business in 2007, then we would have caused probably immense financial damage to all of those different customers. And so I started to change my mindset from, you know, I'm doing you a favor to I'm actually doing you a disservice if I don't turn this into a profitable part of my business. Mm, that's a good point. It's a good way to think of that. Like in terms of billing for time. So obviously when it's the small little quick turnaround things, it just makes sense to bill for time. I mean, what are your thoughts on, I know some agencies bill for, uh, you know, based on the value, not all of them say, okay, well, your website's going to take a hundred hours, our hourly rates say a hundred hours. So the the site costs, what is that? 10 grand. Um, do you recommend doing that? I mean, I've heard the, the other argument being that, you know, you sort of punish yourself for being efficient because it's like the faster you do the project, the, um, the less you end up billing the client for what, what are your kind of thoughts on that? Uh, and that's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of variables there. I think over the years we've tried a variety of different revenue models. And I think that that's kind of what you have to decide as a business owner is, is what is your revenue model? Um, are you, a, you know, are you, are you charging your clients on a fixed price basis? Or are you charging them on more of a time and materials basis? Um, is it more of an estimate and then, you know, and then bill them for actuals or, you know, figuring out that kind of business model. And what, what I would say is when you figure out the business model, you should probably aim to stick with whatever that business model is. So if the question is, you know, is your business model more value-based pricing versus a fee-based pricing, um, you should make that decision and you should stick with whatever method you use because your entire sales process, your entire uh, proposal, follow-up, objection handling process is going to be hinged around that revenue model. Um, people are going to wonder why you're not getting a line item scope of work if you have just a fixed price and no, you know, base for the amount of work that's going into that. Um, we, we personally, you know, we finally had kind of rested on, um, a fixed project price proposal. Um, we did give time in terms of the amount of weeks that it would take to get certain things done. We did not break it down by the amount of hours. Um, but on the back end, we did use, you know, when we tracked our time, we would compare that against, you know, how much time um, we had kind of allocated. And then we used value-based pricing uh, methodologies to get a above average market rate for the work that we were doing. So, you know, in that case, we might have been, you know, realizing $150, $200 an hour on the project work, um, you know, and, and maybe the going rate for web designers were $60 an hour, right? So we were able to get uh, above market rate by leveraging that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, I mean, you've got to, if you've got to pay employees, I mean, at some level, whether you're using value-based pricing or, or fee-based pricing, you know, you should be looking at the profitability of the project, whether you're coming in at a value-based price, which is pricing in terms of the client's value that they're going to receive on their investment versus, you know, the energy that your agency is going to put forward. So I know people that are very value-based pricing and they'll come in and say, Hey, you know, we can deliver a website or deliver a marketing project. That's going to have a, a six figure or seven figure return. And then they price their services accordingly. Um, you know, they still need to figure out, is that work profitable for them? Yeah, that makes sense. So what, um, well, there's a few things here. I mean, what, uh, I guess changes in the sales process. Cause I know a lot of the, um, the posts that I've read that you've written before offer a lot of great advice about kind of changing your mindset early on in the sales process. So, for example, you had written a post about never say uh, WordPress when selling a web design project, and I and I loved it. Um, you, you know, I guess can you kind of walk us through that that idea of you know when when a company comes to you and they say, okay, well, we want a WordPress site, it's very tempting to 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 just give them what they want, but sometimes in the client's mind where you're selling your time or your expertise, they think they're buying a product from you. I'm buying a WordPress site. 
How do you kind of change that that mindset early on in the sales process? So, you know, I, a lot of people that are, um, you know, sales gurus and and that kind of thing, I mean, they talk about the difference between a salesperson and an order taker. So if your client comes to you and says, I need a, a WordPress website, it's going to have five pages on it. I want to use, you know, da, 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 theme, and this is the host I want to put on, right? Give me a price. At that point, if your response is, okay, let me draft up a proposal and send it over to you, more or less you're an order taker. You know, you're not doing any actual sales. Um, you're just taking an order. So that's a very different dynamic than um, working with your customer to understand what they're really after. Nobody really wants a website. So websites all of a sudden came along as a means, as a channel to acquire something else right? What is that person? What is that business truly after? Are they investing in a website to get access to a larger basket of customers? Are they investing in a website to uh, create organizational or logistic uh, efficiencies? Uh, are they investing in a website because they're trying to, um, you know, change their their brand or their perceived perception of their company publicly? Right? What, what is what are they really after with that investment? And that's a, a much more complex conversation, and that requires discovery. It requires research. It requires you to go beyond just. Um, order taking and actually learning about the business. Now that dynamic, a lot of people are very uncomfortable with because it, it changes the power dynamic between you and your client. Uh, if you are a order taker, your client is the, you know, they're, they're the, the customer and you're the vendor, right? It's a, it's a very, um, you know, the dynamic is you're, you're looking up to them. You're, you're, you're begging Alpha them beta. for their business. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Versus, um, if you actually are are good at solution based selling, you know a lot of times you're going to have to deliver maybe bad news to your your potential customer. You're going to have to tell you know educate them. You're going to have to challenge them. You're going to have to lead them to maybe a better end result than what they anticipated. And that's a different power dynamic between you and your customer. Mm. So you want to kind of position yourself um, more of a more of a high end consultant. Um, I mean, I hate to say lawyer, but I mean it really is kind of. The, <laughs> The thing where when you hire a lawyer, you don't want to tell them how to do their job. You want them to tell you what you need to do, right? Even if it's something you don't want to hear. Right. And, and obviously, you know, lawyers, that industry, you know, has received some of the same challenges that uh, that web professionals have, right? You've got legal Zoom and, you know, a lot of the stuff that maybe lawyers were making money on that was really simple and mundane and really boilerplate. Um, has kind of been taken away from them. But simultaneously, the legal landscape in this country and in this world has become ever more complex. And, um, and and they're getting, you know, continued to make huge amounts of money off of off of those types of things, right? So so if if lawyers sat around and tried to make their money off of, you know, boilerplate uh, contracts, things that are easily available for 60 bucks on the internet, they're probably going to go out of business. And the same probably holds true for most web professionals if they think that they can just sit around and, and make you know gobs of money off of the same type of work that people were delivering 15 years ago. Um, that probably is is you know not really um, high value work in my opinion. So figuring out with your client how to help them achieve their ultimate goals that's that's high value that will never go out of style. Um, that will never become a commodity. Mm. It's really hard when you're especially when you're small because. We, we all, I guess, kind of aspire to. If you run an agency, you you, you want to one day get the the big brands, or even just you know maybe if they're not Fortune 500 clients, Fortune 1000, or some sort of large company that you know has a you know gobs of cash and can afford you. And we talked on the show with with agencies that that have done that, and of course they have their own challenges to overcome. Um, but some of the problem is just who you're really going after. I mean, if you're going after a uh, say first time restaurant owner who just opened a a restaurant and you're trying to get a, a ten thousand dollar website out of them. Good luck. It's gonna be it's gonna be difficult. So, I mean, just with like you said about all the boilerplate stuff, the legal zooms. You know, web designers have to contend with you know WordPress themes that are thirty bucks with uh, Wix and Squarespace and all that. It's becoming harder and harder for a web designer to command high rates from simply just doing small, simple websites for small, early stage businesses. Is that right? Um, well, I mean, I think you, you hit on something, which is, you know, where is, 
where is the customer at in their business life cycle? I mean, there's there's 600,000 restaurants in the United States. That's a lot of restaurants, right? Mm-hmm. So when you think about, um, you know, if you are going after restaurants, you know, which ones do have budgets versus which ones don't have budgets? I mean, that's a, that's a, a complex conversation to have. Um, if you're just, you know, taking whatever client happens to blow your way and it happens to be a brand new restaurant where it's a first time restaurant owner and they're opening up a 30 seat cafe, um, you're probably right. Would they have $10,000 for a website? That's probably debatable. Um, would they have $10,000 for a web project that is maybe going beyond just their website and it's actually going to be, you know, maybe you're, you're setting up a, a small website plus, you know, some lead funnels and Facebook, you know, stuff, um, an email list and helping them to create like a new customer indoctrination series. Um, I mean, there's, again, if the restaurant's goal is I want to get more butts and seats and I want to, you know, leverage, uh, my, my, my marketing dollars or my, my internet investment, you know, there, there probably is a project there for $10,000. I mean, they probably spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars getting their, their business up and running. So, so I think it just depends on, on again, who your customer is, where they're at in their market. Um, but I mean, that is, that is a challenge, right? Some of those people, again, back to the order takers, if you're just an order taker and all you want to do is answer the phone and build exactly what your customer wants, then yeah, that probably that brand new restaurant is going to ask for the only thing that they know what to ask for. They're going to say, I need a website with my menu and my hours online. You know, how, what's the price for that going to be? It needs to look good. And, you know, I'm happy to choose that from a template. And at the end of the day, you're probably going to be struggling to get two or three grand out of that person for that type of project. Um, but if you again, shift that, that relationship to something where it's a little bit more in depth to really help that restaurant tour, um, gain more customers online, which I think is what they're really after. Um, I think you'd be surprised at the amount of budgets that will magically appear for a compelling uh, persuasion on that topic. That's a really good point, which is that so many times prospects come to you saying they want whatever, a marketing campaign, a, a website, but really what they're after is customers. So it's like if you can kind of show them that end result, like how many customers, what would, you know, 100 extra customers in the span of a month mean for you or 1,000 extra or whatever it is, just kind of, I guess it's just classic selling results and not uh, features, right? I think that's why the HubSpots and the Infusionsofts are uh, are kind of taken off because, yeah. you know, they, they don't just create, they don't just offer a CRM, they offer the whole package, bringing customers mm-hmm. in. Process, yeah. yeah. And, and what, what, you know, back to this restaurant analogy, you know, what, you know, you've got this system, HubSpot and Infusionsoft. I mean, those are systems that I use. I'm, I'm a web pro I've been in this industry for a long time. Uh, Infusionsoft is something that is, you know, I kind of joke sometimes it's beyond my pay grade. You know, I've got people that work for me that, that deal with most of the heavy lifting there. But the average, you know, restaurateur who's trying to get more customers online, you know, they have no idea what Infusionsoft is. Um, they have no idea what HubSpot is. And so I think there's there's a lot of value in becoming a web professional versus just a, you know, I design HTML and CSS, you know, because if the, the web designer really understands what their customer is truly after, then there is value there. There is opportunity. They just have to start to think about themselves. I think at a much, you know, much more like an actual lawyer, right? Um, the amount of work and time that a lawyer has to go through to become a lawyer is is pretty incredible. And they, they um, solve a, a wide variety of problems. They don't just do, you know, a small, tiny subset of problems. And not just assemblers of contracts. I mean, you know, if exactly. that was listed as their services, they'd, they'd be pretty devalued. It's so hard, too, when you're trying to value yourself or trying to, like, when I, we struggle with this, at least I did, when uh, when we were running our agency where people would kind of say, so why should we go with your agency instead of the other, you know, three or four web design agencies in the same of the same size that do the same size projects? What makes you different? And it was really hard to kind of say anything other than like, look at our work. If you like the work, then go with it. But it's hard. I mean, how do we differentiate? It's it's very difficult. So then you get into these these situations where you send proposals and they look at three web designer proposals that are of a similar size and they just go with the cheapest one because they think it's all the same. I might as well go with the cheapest. Yeah, uh, I think. You know, back to you, you mentioned, you know, some things that I, I teach or talk about in terms of sales process and understanding that. I mean, you know, a lot of web professionals put themselves into that situation and they have to take responsibility for that. So if you are working with a potential customer and they, you know, you get to that magical moment in the conversation where the client, you know, you kind of run out of things to talk about and the client says, well, 
why don't you uh, send us over a proposal? And, you know, the web pro thinks they're being nice, says, oh, yeah, of course. I'll, I'll email you that proposal and I'll follow up with you sometime next week. So they now are in a situation where they've emailed their document. The client's going to print it out and they are going to put it next to their other proposals, right? So they're going to have three proposals and they're going to look at the proposals and they're going to make a decision over what's in the actual proposal. And so the normal web professionals or the, you know, the status quo, I should say, not normal, the status quo web pro process um, is to kind of, uh, to, to, to not sell because they've, they've understood what their client wants and then they outsource their selling to their proposal. And herein lies a critical mistake. Um, you know, your proposal is essentially your offer. It's your solution. It's your, I mean, that's your presentation. That's like the opportunity where you as a web professional get to, you know, tell them why you're better, tell them why what you've built, the solution that you've created is going to solve their real problems. And it doesn't matter that it's twice as expensive as the next guy, because it's going to provide this amazing ROI and you're going to mitigate the risk by doing these three things. And you've got a guarantee and blah, 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 right? You're going to tell them why you're better and you're going to actually sell and persuade them. Uh, and the only way that you can, you know, sell and persuade somebody, you know, in my experience, um, is to sell them, right? And proposals don't sell, right? You don't, having this, you know, text on the page in a, you know, your, your main eight parts of a proposal that kind of doubles as a contract, um, it's not a persuasive uh, argument necessarily. I mean, I, I think by and large, the proposals I've seen um, don't do nearly as good of a job at selling as putting the individual in front of the potential client. Uh, so I think you you do have to tell your client why you're better. You have to tell them why you're proposing to do the things that you're proposing to do. Um, and I think if you do that well, uh, the client will see that you're different and will hopefully not choose the cheapest option on the table. At least in my experience, uh, I oftentimes got the sentence back from clients that, you know, they'd say at the end of the proposal presentation, they'd say, wow, like, you know, you're a lot more expensive than the next guy, but we understand why you're better, why you're different. And that's a good place to be in. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, it almost, uh, like everything you say about just not – people just send the proposals off. They just email them and they never know if their client even opened them. If it went in their junk folder, they might follow up. You know, They might send another email a week later. Hey, I just wanted to make sure you got that proposal. But they don't take the time to like schedule that call and like walk them through it and don't let them just jump to the budget page and, and say yes or no. Yeah, so it's, it's a simple process change, um, which is which is important. But you know, when you're actually sitting there walking through the proposal, uh, you know, that's where you actually get to tell the client, you know, why you're doing all the the different things, and also, you know, sell like handle objections, right? Like one of the biggest parts of selling is that you know your client has an objection to what you've proposed and you know you don't have an opportunity to handle it like that's that's a huge risk when you're pitching new business i mean this happened to me um we, we were pitching some some big business here in denver for, with the denver uh convention center and um i this is kind of before i was really hardcore on my sales process and i've always presenting my proposal um, i was heading out on vacation they couldn't meet with me to review it they said just send it on over we'll have some time to to meet with you uh when you get back from your vacation and i went against my process and i uh, i emailed it over to them and when i got back um i said hey i'd love to to take some time to review that proposal with you and they said oh you know we're we're, we're all good on that uh, we're gonna let you know by the end of the week at the end of the week came and they told us that they decided to go with a different firm the reason that they told us to, that they were going to go with a different firm was because the other firm had proposed um, some custom video content. And I was completely unaware that the client had actually wanted this. And had I presented the proposal or kept that conversation going, um, I potentially could have handled that objection. I could have said, hey, you know what? We actually have a video studio. We actually have some of the best video of any web agency in Denver. It just hadn't become a part of the conversation. So we ended up losing the business because I was unavailable to handle the objection. Um, oh. And so you know, that objection handling is an important part of any sales process. So true. I mean, you're giving me flashbacks now. Mm. I remember like, looking at, <laughs> I remember we had projects that we thought were a hundred percent in the bag. Like there was a company that uh, needed an e-commerce site and they sell this, like they sold um, a high end sort of nutrition product. And we like knew people that in the agency, we were kind of friends with some of them. Like we, we just, we were like, we have it in the bag. So we just came out with this, you know, what we thought was a killer proposal for, you know, here's how we're going to redesign your, your e-commerce store and sell more products and blah, blah, blah. And then the, the company that beat us to it 
had like this was just around the time like HubSpot started getting really big, and they pitched this whole um, you know process methodology for inbound marketing and content creation. And here's how we're going to actually sell more through. Uh, through inbound and measure it all, and we were just and they they were like they won the contract and they probably won a lot more business than just the website alone, and it was devastating because we were I mean we were just banking on that, um you know we we thought that was in the bag so I, <laughs> I'm sure you've uh, yeah you've seen that a lot. I, I have over a thousand proposals in my proposal folder, so those are actual jobs that I, at some level, submitted a proposal, presented a proposal, or uh, or took a swing at business. These aren't people that we, you know, uh, decided not to pursue or didn't qualify or whatever. Um, actual proposals that I, I took a swing at. So I'm sure with you guys, I mean, you obviously have a proposal uh, tool. I mean, you guys have a tool set to help people save time in generating those proposals. And and I think those are, are great because it does take time to put together a proposal. But I think that, you know, the people that are looking for a tool or a trick to actually sell their customer, right? There are no tricks there, right? It, it's kind of like, you know, you would never say to your client, well, you can just, you know, snap your fingers and all of a sudden your business is going to get more customers or whatever. It, there's no trick to getting more customers. Now, there are there are tactics that might work this week that are better than the tactics that worked last week. But at some level, you know, the same business principles apply to how playing companies get more customers. The same goes to, you know, selling, right? That, you know, you can't outsource sales to a proposal. You have to be completely engaged with your customer. You have to know the assumption that, your, even if your client opens your proposal, they're not going to read it. Like that's the that's the level at which you should be playing. You should always assume every single one of your clients is not going to read your proposal. And if you think about that, and you just take that as truth that they're just not going to read it, what are the activities that you're going to do during the sales process to actually get the business? If you just take that as an assumption that they're never going to read your proposal, even if they tell you they've read it, they're never going to read it. Right. So. I would always operate under that assumption. And once I started operating under that assumption, my behaviors, my activities tended to change. Uh, I never, ever would just say to somebody, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to email that over to you. I'd always make sure there's a presentation, that there's a meeting for Q&A, that there's a meeting for a work plan or a kickoff, um, making sure that you're investing that time to sit in front of them on Skype, et cetera, to make sure that um, they're actually consuming uh, your solution. Mm. So just one one question that's, I guess, kind of off topic but related that I kind of want to get your take on. I've, I've asked people this over the time, over the um, course that we've been doing this is that how important do you think uh, the actual owner of the business doing sales, how, how important do you think that is versus selling uh, or, or say hiring a salesperson to kind of help bring in leads and, and business to your web agency? Do you think that's something that you can outsource or that you can train someone to do for you? Do you think that the founder should be the primary salesperson for the business? Well, I mean, I, I think it's a pretty proven model that you could have salespeople for any business. Um, I mean, I think there's, you know, millions of salespeople working for all sorts of different companies and, and the owners of very few businesses probably are the ones that are actively selling. Um in web or for agencies in particular, um, I think that this is something that has, um, it definitely is difficult. It was difficult back when um, I had first started. Um, and I think I, this kind of gets back to some of my, um, my greenness in uh, understanding how to run a business. Um, so one of the, one of the lessons that I've learned uh, in terms of uh, how to accomplish this well is that, you know, what we call sales or what most, the status quo of what people call sales is, is basically like, you know, how do I get more clients, right? How do I get more people, you know, actually contracted? And you look at the activities that the entrepreneur is doing, you know, and they're doing everything through marketing, lead gen, uh, discovery, proposals, solution creation, uh, and, and contract signing, right? They're doing everything end to end. Um, but when you actually understand the dynamics of the, the, the machines that exist within your business, you know, marketing and lead gen is a complete different activity, different skill set, different ideas, different daily activities than, say, uh, qualifying 
than say doing discovery and solution presentations and proposals and closing, right? All of these things are very, very different activities. And what a lot of young agencies try to do is they say, hey, I need more sales. So I'm going to hire a salesperson and they should just do what I do. I'm going to try to replicate myself. And, you know, trying to replicate the entrepreneur is kind of a fool's errand in a way, right? It's going to send you down this path of, um, you know, <laughs> maybe you'll you'll get lucky, but by and large, if you can't afford to pay somebody 150 to 200k a year, um, you just aren't in the market for that type of person. So if you're trying to hire a salesperson on commission, and you know it's going to take them six months of work, and then they're going to make 70 or 80 or 90k, um, it's you're not in the market for that type of person. So what we've done is just separate those two activities out, right? Marketing and lead gen, getting qualified people to fill out a contact form, sign up for a, an introduction call or a qualify call um, is just a specific, that's a specific responsibility and that's a person. And then having somebody that's set up to um, just straight qualify. So making sure that this person actually meets the, the requirements of the business and maybe doing some kind of pre-discovery on them getting information about their business, getting information about um, what they're looking to accomplish, the problems, et cetera, doing some basic market research. That's a very different activity than, let's say, um, actually doing some of the proposal and solution uh, mapping and actually closing the person. So I think that a lot of young agencies try to hire a salesperson, they kick them out the door and they say, go find me business. And then they wonder why their results are, are usually subpar. Right. That's a great idea. Mm. So like my, my salesperson right now for you gurus, um, she has, um, she does calls, scheduled calls every day and her calendar is filled and her, you know, she's doing 20, 30, 40 calls a week. And those are all set up by somebody else's job, right? Somebody mm. else's job is there to kind of market and get the, the pipeline filled. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time, Brent. It was amazing chatting with you. Thank you so much for uh, being on the show. Yeah, there's some great gold there. Really excellent. Well, I appreciate you guys for having me uh, anytime. And uh, I'd love to check out uh, your tool sometime as well and uh, maybe get that out there to our audience as well. It seems like yeah, it's, oh, it's crap. Don't, don't bother. It's, it's garbage. <laughs> <laughs> well, on second thought. No, no, no. It's, it's, uh, we'd, we'd appreciate that. And how can our listeners, who are listen, listeners are mostly made up of small web agency owners, how can they – learn more about you gurus is there anything you know special in particular you you'd like them to check out yeah sure you know i'd be happy if you guys um you know they're gonna have to check out our website yougurus.com u-g-u-r-u-s.com um, our main program right now is 10k boot camp it's the only online training program that teaches and challenges web professionals to sell their first or next ten thousand dollar project so we're really um, focused on high value projects uh, and really teaching those web professionals how to break through that barrier uh, which it's it's a great community we've had hundreds of people graduate that program um, so if you're interested in that you can check out our website yougurus.com we also have some courses um, some I usually put out there is if you email me brent at yougurus.com uh let me know which of our courses you'd like to pick up and i'd have to be happy to to give that away to uh your audience so if they're interested in one of our our courses they're they're 200 usually but if you email me brent at yougurus.com uh, i'll get you set up with one of those courses as well as a free strategy call oh man that's, that's really great. generous yeah. thank you i think people are going to love that so that's awesome we'll check that out we're going to post a link to that in the show notes and uh, once again, thanks for, for being on the show, Brent. Yeah, Kevin, Kyle, it's been a pleasure. All right, thanks, Brent. Have Take a great care. one. Bye. So it's the end of the year, end of the season. Kyle, what is your advice? Do you have any words of wisdom at the end of the 2015? Any vision Well, I mean, this was the first season of Agencies Drinking Beer. It was an experiment about a year ago, I think it was February when we actually launched the first episode, but um, we we thought, hey, let's give it a shot and talk to some agency owners, and it's resonated with a lot of people, so I want to thank those who have listened to this past year. I think we're going to try to kick it up a notch and make it even better in 2016 for season two. Like, are we going to get singers? We could. <laughs> actually, we should come up with a theme. Like, a, like a, we have, we have. Jen, do your Kyle song. Treat the listeners to that. Give them a Christmas present. So I think when I used to lose work, listeners. No, it's I... at the end. Nobody listens to the shit anyway. Okay. So at the, when I worked at Impact with Jen, 
every time I came in the, her office or walked by her or she caught a, my scent or something. <laughs> Your scent. Every time my scent <laughs> came to Jennifer, she would sing a song. And in the song, uh, shattered my eardrums every day. And I asked oh, her to stop, but now I, this. but now I'm You've happy about this. You've heard me say it because it used to irrit. I had to stop doing it because it irritated him. Like I used to to sing it at to him at, at. Do at, your uh, worst version of that song. I feel like I want to hear it. Hurt something. No, do it. Kyle, 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 Kyle. Okay, yeah, that was wonderful, wasn't it? That was great. <laughs> Excellent. And actually, I like that. You like that? I didn't like it at the time, but I like it now. It was irritating. I really don't know <laughs> why you continued to speak to me, and I don't know why it made me sing it. It was like the equivalent of little boys in elementary school chasing girls with snakes and trying just to, just to annoy them. So you're saying like you I had a crush hair. on you, and I was chasing you with the snake of my <laughs> song? Your song was like a garden snake. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Uh, Kevin, what what end of year? Got anything to say at the end of the year? <laughs> He's not even close to the mic as usual. He's sitting like I'm eighty you guys yards back. This one. I'm just enjoying. Nobody can hear you. Nobody can hear you. It's okay. Keep going. Kevin's no. the wind be- beneath our wings. Kevin, you have been the the heart and soul of this podcast since I February. I promise everyone, our listeners, that I will have better microphones, better production. <laughs> I think in that's a, new a year. good one. Good, yes. good one. Yes, All right. Good yes. one. Condenser Santa, mics. Santa's going to make our podcast condens- yes. dreams come true. Yes, he is. Awesome. It's on my list. But I mean, aren't we? Aren't aren't you thankful to those who have just even listened to this bullshit for the last year? Big time. Uh, one of my uh, most fulfilling. Moments was when we were in Montreal and someone came up to me. They saw my Proposal Five shirt and they said, oh, "I love your podcast." Yeah, okay. I loved that. Yeah. 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 Uh, There's like three of those people in the world. I know. It feels amazing. <laughs> it does feel good. <clears throat> uh, but as we go into the new year, we need people to come forward and uh, and want to be on the podcast. It's true, especially. We- Female founders. We would love to have more women on the show. Lots more women. So women, come on. <laughs> come forward. They heard the message. Please. They will respond. Yeah, and they're nice guys. Who and is? Maybe I'll sit in. You guys. No, we're not. We're terrible people. <laughs> and if you're afraid of Kyle, all the women out there, <clears throat> listen, we can get Jennifer to interview you if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, That's exactly. Right. I'm so intimidating. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah whatevs. All right. I think. Let's wrap this. Let's wrap year it up. up. Happy Christmas. What did we say? Merry Christmas. We say Happy Merry New Year. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy Holidays, Hanukkah, whatever you celebrate in the world. I hope you're having fun. I hope you're getting drunk. And uh, thank you for listening. Yes. And here's two uh, big things for everybody in 2016. Yeah. Woo! See you Woo!